Hi, my name is John Economaki, and for the past 25 years, I've been the chief tool designer for Bridge City Toolworks in Portland, Oregon. I moved to Portland in 1973 to be a school teacher at Lincoln High School, and it was a wonderful, wonderful job. Um, it was always part of my career to have a job that made a difference, and teaching is certainly one of those careers. 1977, I had an opportunity to take a three-week seminar in the summer from Sam Maloof, furniture maker in Anderson Ranch in Aspen, Colorado. And I realized at the time that that was my calling, so I came back from that uh, experience and quit my job and became an independent furniture designer. I continued to make furniture, design and make furniture, and had a wonderful career. I ended up uh, with about a three-year backlog in designs. And unfortunately for me, I ended up with a hyper allergic reaction to wood dust and I had to quit overnight. I made everything that you could possibly imagine for a residential, including clocks, wooden geared clocks, um, tables, chairs, and I had customers all over the world. Exhibitions in New York City, San Francisco, pieces in Tokyo. Um, it was a trying time. I had to come up with a new line of work overnight. I had made tools for myself as a furniture maker and I thought maybe there are other people who would like to have tools that are nice and so I ran an ad in the National Magazine in 1983 and uh, the rest as they say is history. I think. One of the things I realized early on as a furniture maker is that I had to have a portfolio and I had taken a sheet in my garage and tried to make a photo studio and then I would go to a black and white rental dark room and print prints and they were uh, what, less than professional and so the dark room attendant who was a character at the time and this is back in the mid 70s uh, came by the print dryer and asked me if I was a woodworker and I told him yes and his comment was well it's kind of hard to tell with these crappy pictures and uh, which did not offend me because I, are, I knew they were terrible so I asked him if he was a photographer and he said he was and I said how much would you charge me to shoot this item and he said fifty dollars and so I gave him the item he shot it and as ironic as it may sound, that piece is in the Smithsonian. The very first professional piece of work I had photographed ended up being purchased by the Renwick Gallery. Um, I learned early on that photography was a very important part of who I was and how it was my ambassador to the world because obviously I couldn't go pitch what I was doing to people myself. So it's important. As a furniture maker, uh, one day when things weren't going well, I realized as I looked around my shop that I had, that most of my tools, most of the time, sat and did nothing. In the old days, back in the 90s, early 90s, in fact 1992 is when I first started drawing on a computer, uh, the only thing that was available was 2D wireframe work, meaning that if I wanted to create a box, I had to do so using wireframe tools and now when we work with solids it's a little bit different so you can see I went through the, about the fastest possible way you could make a wireframe cube um, but with solids it's a lot faster not only that, we have the ability to do things to solids that are just lightning fast. And we also have the ability to look at it in all angles. One of the things I like about using the pen as opposed to the mouse, first of all, I actually believe that had this particular, the ability to write on a monitor been available back in 1982 when the P IBM PC first came out, there'd be no such thing as a mouse. Um, the disconnect from working with one hand off to one side of your monitor and yet you're looking on the screen is manageable, but it's nowhere near as intuitive as being able to highlight that line, pick up that endpoint, and come over here and move this and blow this apart. 
So I really like the ability of the pen and I can program whatever I want. Right now my first button here is my move tool and I can move my stuff on my screen wherever I want it. And then if I'm using a live tool, like for example I have a primitive tool right now to draw primitives and we'll change that color to red. I have the ability to get my selection arrow back by clicking the rear button and there's my selection arrow so now I can take this and move it wherever I want and so I have in one hand two of the most common things I do in a session and my sessions usually run eight nine hours a day so this is a lot faster than the left or right mouse button also too the other nice thing about the pin built in is that when I touch the pin to the screen that is the equivalent of a left mouse click so I don't have to do anything so the left mouse click is gone and also too if I hold the pin down, that little circle pops up, that's the equivalent of a right mouse click. So I have most of the functions that are built into a mouse right in this pin. And over a day of using this, you save a lot of time. Once a year we make one tool, we call it our commemorative tool. And I got inspired on a napkin, as often is the case. And now I would like to get this into my CAD package. Uh, one of the drawbacks to CAD is that it's almost impossible to do uh, what I call doodles. Um, uh, fortunately or unfortunately for me, I have no training, artistic training whatsoever. So I've developed techniques that work for me. One of the things about industrial design is that you have to have a starting point for every project. In this particular case, this is a hand plane. We're going to make it once. Uh, we're going to have a substantial expense in the tooling to have this cast. Uh, we're going to have all these custom parts made. And in this particular case, this handle has a sinuous quality to it that I'm going to be working on. And so I, I really like to work with, with broad uh, circles and the reason I like the wide width is it gives me some latitude when I narrow my pin down to come down and create a form that's uh, more graceful. So uh, this particular handle, it's the heart and soul of what I'm working on. So from these three circles, I would close my pin down. But this is going to work out pretty good. Now that I have this darkened in, I'm just going to sort of refine my curve a little bit. Again, this is really nothing more than a crude representation of what I want to accomplish. Again, this is for no other purpose than just me making something that looks sort of realistic. Really crude, but effective. And what I want my hand to do is fit in here, and I have no idea if this is going to be comfortable, but I'm going to design the tool around this. And I'm going to do this part first. I'm going to have a prototype of this built. And once I have the prototype built, I will actually fit it to my hand and figure out how close I came to guessing whether or not I was right or not. All right, I've imported my doodle into Cobalt, and my next step is to uh, trace over this profile and with the objective of having a prototype built. And we're going to build a prototype using 3D printing, which is a fairly new tool that's available to designers that will allow me very inexpensively to find out whether this actually will fit my hand. There really is no other way other than have someone build one of these or carve it out of wood. Neither option, of course, is as inexpensive as having a 3D print made or a stereolithography print. So what I'm doing aesthetically right now, even though I know this part probably is going to need to be redone, 
is I'm trying to work out most of the other details that won't need to be redone and get those right on this go. And that's my intent for um, this particular component. And I really can't proceed with any other aspects of this tool, this plane, until I get all this stuff right. And getting things right is not always easy. All right, now that I've got that bulk profile done, I want to make sure that all of my geometry is in the same plane and all my corners are connected. And we'll see if we can't get this to extrude. And we just extruded that. And the distance, we're going to do that as 0.73. It can't be over this. And now I can come back in around the ends. And you can see that it's starting to take shape. Well, the next thing I want to do is take this center section out, completely out, and I'm going to do that also with an extrude move. I'm going to extrude this face, and I'm going to go in that distance, and that will be 0.24. And we'll change that color so it's easy to see. Make it red. Then we'll go to the top view. And while that's selected, we're going to clone a copy of it. To there. And then one of the great tools of all time, these Boolean subtract tools, we're going to subtract out those cheeks. And now when you see the part, I've taken a big chunk of that out. Now I've got this basic profile done. And I've got some radius work and whatnot I want to do in here, but none of that really is that important until I find out if this gets, uh, fits the hand. So what I'll do right now is I'm going to export this. So in order to make sure that everything worked out perfect, I decided to make a field trip over to Sherpa Design in Portland and see Patrick, who owns Sherpa, and watch the 3D printing process. They have a a fairly new printer that prints in color. I had never seen one before. And uh, it, it's just a fascinating, fascinating process. It works similar to like an inkjet printer. However, as opposed to the inkjet spraying ink on paper, what happens is, is that it literally fuses a very, very thin layer of a starch-like material. Uh, it's about three and a half thousandths thick to the previous layer. So the model, my handle, would have been sliced in his computer into three and a half inch thousandth layers. And then as, the, as that 3D printer passes over each layer, starting from the bottom up, it takes and prints the first three and a half thousandth slice. And then on the second pass, it prints the second three and a half thousandth slice. And so in this particular case, uh, this tool being there's probably three or four hundred slices that got printed and then we'll get uh, a part back that will allow me to test it in my hand. Well, this is the stereolithography part that came back and as I put this in my hand it's got all kinds of issues not the least of which is this is way too aggressive and sharp it digs into the top part of my hand this is too aggressive it feels terrible um, Actually, the only thing that's right on it are the holes. So it looks like I'm going to have to start over and redo, take, take a lot of material out of this hump, 
and then flare this back out. And then once I do that, I will have a new profile here that I will use to shape the back part of the plane. Well, here's my new design. <clears throat> and when I compare it to my old one, it looks um, like it should be just perfect. And we'll see if we can't compare these side by side. And I have a hunch that that's going to fit just great. I can see that I've taken a lot of the bump out and I've opened that up. And just, I'm guessing, I guessed on the curves, but I think I'm going to be just fine. And I'll get that part back and one more final check before I commit to the rest of the tool. Well, here we are in Photoshop again, full circle. I started out with a little doodle in Photoshop. Here's the finished stainless steel handle. It's a beautiful photograph by Joseph Felsman. We've been uh, doing business together now for over 30 years. He's got some fascinating uh, digital photography techniques. This is actually an image that consists of about somewhere between 70 and 80 different shots. And they're composited together to bring out all the highlights and whatnot.